James Tate entered my life again as a graduate student when I was wandering through these uh, communities, listening to songs and stories. I actually think way back when to when I started to investigate the landscape of others who had maybe done some similar work, and I actually landed on a treasure trove, this young Shetlander who arrived at Spence's Bridge in 1884 and spent until he died in 1922 uh, just immersed in that culture, not just as, a, as an outside reacher, but uh, researcher, but as a uh, as, as one who hunted one and married into the local indigenous community, one who just had this infinite curiosity for how do they use their plants? What are, how, when I hunt with them, what are they doing? What are, what are things like the sweathouse traditions? Where do their beliefs lie? What are their stories? What is their connection to this long-term connection to this place? He recorded hundreds of songs, and I was initially interested in songs with masses of field notes and all the local people at Spence's Bridge involved in this song project named. Uh, it was a treasure trove for me, but he also worked with an anthropologist who was based in New York who became what they call the father of American anthropology, Franz Boas. So there's sort of this really neat connection to New York City as this big, larger-than-life figure who gains a larger-than-life reputation really draws heavily on this little local Shetland. Shetlander ended up in British Columbia, big game hunting, traveling, uh, working with the native people, uh, always, you know, really socialist consciousness who, uh, from 1908 till he died in 1922, took on political advocacy work, taking chiefs off to... Victoria and Ottawa because the land issue was really, really hot, heated then. They had no one to translate. They were all monolingual in their own languages. They didn't speak English. He was the one of the only ones who could not only translate but knew the me the messages that they wanted to convey and could really get those across. So one of our major political activists for that time away. So I'm arguing, I have been arguing and will argue in this book, which is almost finished, that really we have one of the most outstanding, most progressive, most ahead of his times, ethnographer, anthropologists in North America, who's been almost completely overlooked. You won't find him in the end indices of, of major histories of anthropology. He just doesn't exist. So that's a very nice hook, a very nice lead for me, uh, but just the depth of all of this ethnography. So I've been fortunate because in ad addition to these contemporary voices and perspectives, I have this layer of voices and perspectives from the 19, from 1895, from 1900, from 1912, named sources, recorded sources, hundreds of stories, place names, the right political headspace, you know, he rejected traditional organized relig uh, Western religion. He just came in with the right headspace, uh, right political consciousness. So what he recorded fits so well with how I like how I like to sort of see things. So for me, I have the perfect backdrop. So he informs a lot of what I write about, what I have written about and what I do in my courses. It's just wonderful to have that. So much of the turn of the century anthropologist was written sometimes by people with a progressive understanding of things, but not with the, not with the contemporary understanding and the passion for just the, the hardship and the, just the, how the colonization process had affected these people and how their rightful situation, well, for most of the anthropologists, this was all dead. They were dying. They were gone. So you reach back to this pre-contact sanitized so-called past and retrieve what you can. That's never been my approach. What I love about Harry Robinson in the contemporary times is he speaks to the present so beautifully. You, you know, when you're looking for his, his, his reach into 500 years ago, you'll sort of find that. But much more, it's 19th and 20th century and 21st century connection. And for Tate, it really was connected with his, his present and the hard times of the present and the injustices of the present. So his ethnography has that all through it. We don't have anthropology for North America, for the turn of the 20th century that mirrors that or matches that in any way. So in that sense, I've been so fortunate to land on an archival source that's unlike any of its kind for my region, 
and also for all these contemporary voices. And I haven't even mentioned the wonderful layer of, of published historians of British Columbia that have also aided this project. Wonderful work by Cole Harris, wonderful work by John Lutz, my colleague, uh, Adele Perry, um, uh, the list goes on and on. For the region that I work in, Keith Smith, um, who's, who's, who works on the, you know, the, the politics of the region, um, just really, really great, uh, great, I would say, new work in British Columbia that I can also draw on. That's Daniel Clayton, who's done work on post-colonial theory as applied to our region. Just really, really important historical sources, secondary sources, historians, my own colleagues who've really helped me also with just the right approach to what I'm looking at. And then this great archival base and these indigenous voices. It makes for almost a completely perfect package for somebody like myself.